Well, good morning, everyone. Let me check my microphone. It's on, maybe, ish. Cool, well, good to be with you guys this morning. Hope you're all doing well. Um, yeah, I'm gonna start off with a little story this morning. The year was 2015, and I was um, all pumped. We were gonna have this new girl from El Salvador. Her name is Tatiana, plot spoiler, I married her. Um, we, yeah, thank you, I agree. Um, but we are going to have this new girl come and help out with the youth, and, and a big part of helping out with the youth here is driving 15 passenger vans. And uh, we love the vans. You get into the most interesting conversations with junior high kids and high school kids in those vans. Um, but one thing that we like to do with people that come brand new to the island is to make sure that they feel comfortable driving. These vehicles are really long. They have a strange turning radius, you know. Sometimes turning that thing around, you have to do like a 45-point turn <laughs> just to try to make that thing around. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, making sure she's feeling good with it. And I'm like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to do a driver's test. We're going to make sure that you can do some parking, that you feel happy and comfortable. She's like, okay, that's fine. I'm not too worried about it. And I'm like, no, like, these vans are pretty big. Like, you know, you got to check the blind spots. You have to, and all these different things that I'm training her in how to drive the van. Well, she passes this test with flying colors. Great driver, all those things. And I come to understand a little bit better why she has this crazy driving ability. Fast forward a few months, and uh, I'm in El Salvador. We're dating. I'm meeting her family. And she picks me up from the airport. And I realized that driving in El Salvador <laughs> is a whole other animal <laughs> compared to driving on Kauai. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little scale here. Driving on Kauai, difficulty level about here, okay? Driving the mainland, you know, we're going up maybe like 14 lanes in L.A. We're moving up, okay? Then we got Tijuana, Mexico, which... <laughs> It's intense, it's, it's interesting, there's definitely less rules. Then you got El Salvador, <laughs> which is up here. You got this city of San Salvador that has millions of people crammed into this tiny valley, and they're driving through these streets that are very, very narrow, and uh, they're trying to set speed records <laughs> about how fast they're going in between places. I was so intimidated to drive there and watching my wife just navigate it, know the whole map in the back of her head and understand this made me feel really stupid about asking her to do a driver's test here on the island of Kauai. And um, it's one of those things where she came into this, especially the driving, just being super overqualified. <laughs> and having no idea. See, having Tatiana drive a van is kind of like asking Steve Jobs to fix your computer, <laughs> all right? <laughs> They're going to be able to do it. It's kind of like asking Gordon Ramsay to make you a PB&J sandwich, <laughs> you know? Or maybe asking Sir Elton John to sing you the, the beloved song of Happy Birthday, <laughs> right? Overqualified, really, really good, something that's simple but done really well. We've been talking through the book of Acts here on Sunday mornings, and I have the privilege to jump in into Acts chapter 6, Dane leaving off last week in Acts chapter 5. And uh, the, the book of Acts is really Luke 2.0 that goes from focused, being really focused around Jesus' life in the book of Luke to Acts that begins talking about the Acts of the Apostles or the early church. And what has happened is the Holy Spirit, the promised comforter, powerful Holy Spirit, has fallen into the hearts and into the lives of those disciples and the group around that is believing in Jesus, being the king, being who he claimed to be, coming as the Messiah and establishing that. And these people, being filled with the goodness of the Holy Spirit, are just going crazy. <laughs> there's powerful things, there's miracles, there's people just coming to the realization and the church is growing exponentially day by day. Now, we need to remember that the apostles, this is a new situation. <laughs> this is a brand new world that they're embarking in and there's hiccups along the way that are going on. 
We talked last week, Dane talked about the hiccup of the Jewish authorities who were just like, listen, you have to stop talking about this. <laughs> and them just going forward and the apostles saying, we cannot, but instead let me tell you the whole gospel. <laughs> and being bold in that gospel in the midst of everything going on. Well, in chapter 6, we got another little hiccup along the road of establishing the church and of dealing with the different situations that are coming up. Let's pull up Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. What you have here are two different groups of widows. And we understand that God has a heart for those that, that cannot always provide for themselves. I think about the verse in James that says, religion that is pure and faultless is this, taking care of orphans and widows in their distress and from keeping oneself from being polluted from the world. This desire that God has to care for those that are not necessarily the strong ones out there working and able to provide for themselves, but making sure that they are part of the family and receiving like the family should. And we have two different groups of widows here, two different cultures, two different languages that would have been predominantly spoken between the two groups. You have the Hellenistic Jewish widows, which would have probably been Greek-speaking, and they would have probably been a little more worldly, having different ideas through the Greek way of thought. And then you have the Hebrew widows, which would have been probably very strictly following the religion of Judaism and would be speaking Hebrew. And I love the disciples' response to this. I want to read it for us in verse 2 through 6. It says this, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurius and Nicanor. I'm just making up how you pronounce these names. I don't speak Greek. <laughs> um, and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So the disciples, I think, are kind of walking into a sticky situation here. You've got two different groups of people here in the church. You've got two different cultures, and there is a lot of opportunity for cultural offense to occur. Sound familiar? <laughs> And instead of trying to get into the nitty-gritty and talk about all the philosophies of how we're going to distribute this bread, they just say, hey, listen, like, we're going to need to call on some other people to make sure that this need is met. We don't care about the cultural differences. We want to make sure that this need is met. And instead of being focused on all these other details, they go right down the middle of the road to find a solution to this problem. And the solution that they find is to look for other men that can run this and to diversify <laughs> their leadership, to not give up what they're doing. What they're doing was very, very important in preaching the word and in prayer, but to make sure to, to spread the love <laughs> of the service of the community and the body of believers here. I love the qualifications that are given to these seven. They're looking for the seven guys that are the best at this. And remember, they're looking for people that are able to collect, purchase food, and distribute it. Okay? It doesn't necessarily look like a holy service, 
But the qualifications are very interesting. That they would be men of good repute, that they would have a good reputation, and that they would be known in the community. And that these men would be known to be full of the Spirit. Love that. And of wisdom. The qualifications, I don't know how much they have to do, like surface level, with distributing food to the widows. But for them, the most important part was that God was alive and active and powerful in these people's lives. Then it speaks to one of the men that was selected. His name is Stephen. And the Bible talks about Stephen in just glowing reviews. It says this in verse 5. It says that Stephen is a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, it describes Stephen as being full of grace and power, doing great miracles. And then in verse 10, it talks about Stephen talking with opposition to the faith and said that the opposition could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking. He was a man of power. He was a man that knew God and allowed the Holy Spirit to exercise through him and to flow out. And not only was he smart, right, smart, but, but it was godly wisdom. And not only was there godly wisdom, but there was power that came along with it, miraculous power. And this guy is set up to be one of the guys that's going to distribute food to the widows. I think it's really cool what they valued in the early church to be serving. And not only just serving and being up front of people and speaking and being a, a communicator, but in serving the widows that were not able to take care of themselves. To me, it kind of looks like a possible overqualification, <laughs> except for the fact that God really loves his widows, really loves to take care of them. But to me, it looks like these guys had so much going for them, and yet they were humble enough, and I guess it kind of adds to what they have going for them, humble enough to take care of the tasks of the church in service. This really reminds me of Jesus, the servant, the one that came and had all the power, all the insight, all of the potential, and yet came and served. I want to read out of the book of John, chapter 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Starting in verse 13, it says this. Jesus is talking here. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should just do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Mm. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. The church was looking for servants. They were looking for guys that would be able to go out and meet the practical needs so that there would not be division, but that everyone would be taken care of in the way that they knew they were to take care of them. And these guys who come in with this insane qualification and potential of being out there doing miracles and showing wisdom are the ones that take their role very, very seriously in making sure that the community and that the, the widows are taken care of and served. Well, it was a really good strategy. <laughs> and it worked out really, really well for the church. In fact, we see this in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This little section has a, a bit of a sandwich going on. At the beginning of the section, it says the disciples were increasing in number. And then at the end of the section, it says the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. 
I like multiplication more than I like addition, especially when we're talking about the church and its growth and the ones that are coming to become true disciples of Jesus Christ. I love this too, just a little tag on the end. Great many of priests became obedient to the faith. How beautiful must that have been? The religious leaders that were often known to be stubborn and hypocrites and wielding the law are becoming obedient to the faith of Jesus Christ. I just absolutely love that. So what does this story, this section of scripture mean? What does it mean to someone that lives on the island of Kauai, 2020? Everything's got to be different, right? There's nothing that could possibly apply to us today. Yeah, right. The cultural tension that's brought up here, I just love how the church meets it. Dane talked a bit about this last week, and I think that it just applies the same way when Dane brought up what is the church's stance of this shark being this close to this boat? <laughs> what is the church's stance on masks? What is the church's stance on race? What is the church's stance on fill in the blank? And the answer is middle of the road, gospel-centered Christianity. Not getting caught in the details, but by remembering the things that are more important. What was important to God and to the church in this specific section, it was that the widows were taken care of. It wasn't important what language they spoke (laughs) or what they were all about. What was important was that they were taken care of. And I love that this, this form of love that they spread over the widows just covered over all the details. (laughs) And they're just like, you know what? We're just gonna make sure we got a good crew of guys that are overqualified spiritually, that will make sure to take care of this situation. I think this passage paints a really cool picture of the, of the Christian moral of humility. That these guys, in the midst of their power and in the midst of their strength in God, were ones that wanted to humbly serve and serve the tables. Humility is one of those things that is infectious and beautiful and does not come naturally to humans. I'm really convinced that a lot of our sin has to do with the lack of humility before the Lord. And that the original sin that we see taking place in the garden is not necessarily the eating of the fruit that was a part of it, but the idea that I know better than God. And God might say something, and he might have created this whole thing, but I know better. (laughs) And it's ridiculous. And yet, it's something that humanity struggles with every single day. I struggle with every single day is this idea that I know better than God. A good way to fight pride is to serve and to do something humbly before someone else that you don't need to do, that doesn't do anything for you, but instead is just a pure gift of wanting to because it matters and because it's a good thing rather than something that's just going to feed yourself. By the way, I've I've really seen this in the leadership of this church. I'm going to brag for a second on, on some of these guys, man. I can't tell you how many times I've caught Rick trying to unload an entire truck full of tables by himself. (laughs) And I'm just like, what the heck? Can't you call the young guys to come do this? Like, you don't have to do it. But he has a heart of service. And he is willing to do any task that is ever asked of someone here. Maybe not leading worship. Rick, do you want to lead worship sometime? Okay. Next week. Sounds good. Um, I see this as well with Mike Wellman being out there, hooking up his trailer to the back of his car, bringing down all his tools and just like burning the weeds. He has like a blowtorch. It's awesome. Burns the weeds around the pickleball court. He doesn't need to do that. 
but he comes and serves because it's what he's all about. I see it with Dane. He's always signing up to take care of bathrooms, take care of the sanctuary. And then let's talk about the service of those costumes during family camp. <laughs> it's awesome. But he does that because he's a humble guy. A pastor that's full of himself does not put on a onesie <laughs> in front of everyone. And I love that about these guys. I also want to talk about Steve. If you guys have ever been to the North Shore Church, man, that guy runs around and sweats through his shirt every single Sunday just to make sure that it is a place that is warm and welcoming and friendly. And he loves to make sure, especially the kids coming through, are having a nice time at church. James 4, 6 says something really interesting about humility. It says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Man, when God opposes the proud, to engage in pride is kind of like trying to play tug of war, where on the other side of the rope is God. It's not the place we want to find ourselves. We want to find ourselves in humility, just like these men that were appointed were willing to humbly serve their community. I think specific to our church, on the island of Kauai, we're in one of the top tourist destinations of the entire world. And right now, tourism is pretty much non-existent. But we have an opportunity, being people that live here, to extend this hospitality that many people that are looking here are, are looking to connect with. And I know that that much of our industry is hospitality-based. And I know that it's difficult dealing with people, serving them at their table, and they have certain expectations. <laughs> and I know that it's not the easiest thing to do, but I think that we have a real opportunity as a church, living where we do, to engage in friendship and kindness with those strangers that we do not know. And to just be kind in the middle of it. When someone gets lost and is doing a turnaround in the middle of the highway, instead of honking, maybe just try to see if they need some help. When you see someone in a line that is way too long for your meal, instead of kind of being bummed and just being on your phone, engage people in conversation. Tell them a few of your favorite spots. It might really make their entire trip <laughs> to meet someone that lives here that would be kind enough and humble enough to engage with them in what they're all about. And I don't want to take away from the service industry. There isn't real authenticity you can bring to that and to those tables in combining your job with serving others and with loving them in humility. But there's something about doing it when you're not getting paid to do it as well that is really very special. I think especially coming up, the first waves of tourists that are going to come back <laughs> at a certain point, it's going to feel weird. And a lot of people are going to be very worried and scared about what they're bringing with them, a.k.a., COVID-19. <laughs> but if we are able to look past the mask to the human and be loving and kind and hospitable in that moment, what a beautiful, honoring thing that would be to God is his church working like that. Lastly, I want to talk about the qualifications. The best thing about Stephen was God. <laughs> And it's really nice that when we bring our lives to the table and when we really ask God to grab a hold of us, the best part of ourselves is God. <laughs> that means we don't have to bring something, <laughs> but God will come in and he will qualify you in his strength. And he will be there for you, coming alive helping you to care about the things that he cares about, and then giving you the strength to be doing it. If you don't feel qualified to be hospitable and to serve people, talk with God. 
Ask him what that's all about. And ask him to be the one that you reflect more than your own image of who you feel that you are. This passing of of the love of God is really what I think being a Christian is all about. My encouragement to us today is to be like the seven that were appointed. (laughs) To have the strengths that they had. And then to be humbled to be able to do whatever it is God is asking of us. That there is no task too lowly for us to engage in. And that we can be people that are looking with spiritual eyes out at the needs of those around us. And that we're able to really engage into this world bringing the love of God with us. Let's pray. God, you're really good, and um, the things that you're concerned about are really worthy. Lord, I just want to pray right now that we can be people that can receive your love and that can, in humility, dish it out. Lord, let us be people that are not proud, but instead humble before you. And let us be people that, that are hospitable and kind, and spiritual, and meeting people with the needs that they have. Lord, we love you, we want to live for you, and we want your beautiful, precious love to flow through us into this community. You name it, pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys would go ahead and stand up for a short benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Well, have a great Sunday, everyone.